we, uh, we're going to change gears just a little bit. I will have to give you a little disclaimer. My new title at Scripps is actually Corporate Vice President Chief Experience Officer, which I find fascinating because when I was first exposed to patient experience about 10 years ago, we had an administrator come and speak with our physician group, and I will tell you, it was completely turned off because he wanted us to script and say things that sounded completely unnatural to our patients, including, are we providing you with exceptional care today, or are we exceeding your expectations? And it just sounded really dumb, and so I wasn't going to say it, so I was completely turned off. But then I ran the ER at Radies Children's and had four urgent care centers that reported to me, and every day I saw interactions that should have been done differently. So learn from some of my mistakes. I'll share those with you as well, and hopefully you'll get something out of this next uh, half hour. All right, very tough time to be in medicine. You guys all know this. The triple aim is a little schizophrenic, right? We have to improve the patient experience. We have to cut cost, and we have to keep people healthy. It's a little bit at odds, right? Because sometimes you can't make everybody happy. You can't keep everybody healthy if they're not engaged. And it's really hard to cut costs sometimes, depending on what the patient needs. So it's, it's, a, it's a tough time to be in medicine. So I was happy to see Jan talk about burnout. You really can't talk about patient experience if, if it doesn't go hand in hand with how our providers are, are feeling. I actually don't like the word providers. I think we're all clinicians, right? And so that does go hand in hand. I do a lot of coaching at the bedside with our physicians. And I'll tell you that when their scores start coming up, they feel like they have a better day as well because there's nothing more nerve-wracking than feeling like you're providing really good care and then you get the surveys back and it's just it's disconcerting and so some of these little tricks will actually help you and actually help help you have a better time as well you all know when patient comes to the e come to the ER a lot of things that don't seem important to you are important to them right and this this actually came to me when I was already an attending physician so I'm double board in emergency medicine and pediatric emergency medicine and I had my first child I was probably five years out of, of training, and she started breathing like this. <laughs> what is that? Fast and then almost nothing, then fast and, and nothing. Is it? Chain stokes in adults. Actually, it's periodic breathing in kids, right? It's called periodic breathing. That's fine. Chain stokes is where I went. That's exactly where I went, right? It's my kid. I'm thinking this is 2 o'clock in the morning, right? So I start packing my bag, right? And my husband says, what are you doing? I'm like, we're going to the ER. And he goes, do you realize you're double board in emergency medicine and pediatric emergency medicine? People come to you for this? And I go, you're right. If I go to the ER, they don't think I'm nuts, right? But I'm a little better now about taking care of people that come in for things that I thought were kind of dumb, right? So now when I have a patient that comes in with periodic breathing, I put them on the monitor and I make them look at the O2 sats and I make them feel a lot better. So I'm a much nicer doctor now when I have my own kids than I probably was before. Right? So put yourself in that situation as well. A lot of times they're in pain. I think we have to resist the, that inclination that people come to the ER just because they want a prescription. The studies have shown time and time again that if you explain to them what they need and what they don't need and give them a, a backup plan, right? we call it the WASP, wait and see prescription. I don't know if you guys have heard of that at all. But the studies have shown that most of those patients that you give a prescription to, if you explain why they don't need to fill it, meaning here's why you should fill it, they actually don't fill the prescription, which I think, actually think is pretty cool. They just want a contingency plan because I definitely don't want them having to come back to the urgent care. They get really annoyed when they come to see you or somebody else, and then that very same day they go someplace else and somebody gives them an antibiotic for what I call no-titus media. Do you guys know what that is? Right? There's absolutely nothing wrong with this patient's ear and somebody feels the need to put them on antibiotics and they feel justified. Right? And so if you give them a plan, they are not going to be annoyed with you and most of those patients will not fill the, the prescriptions. The same study actually showed that people that you give the prescription to that actually need to fill it, 13% of those don't fill it in the first place. Well, that really annoys me because, you know, with Epic now, it takes forever to put in a prescription and all that stuff. If you're not going to fill it when I give it to you, that's actually really more frustrating. So the wait and see prescription is, is just that. If you feel like they maybe they might need it in a couple of days or the symptoms get work, worse, you actually give them the prescription and you tell them when to start it. You know, if, you, if your kid gets sick in 24, 48 hours or they're having more pain or fever, go ahead and start the antibiotic. Otherwise, we want to not have you do that because you might get antibiotic-associated diarrhea. That puts the fear into everybody, right? You talk about diarrhea and, you know, people having to miss days of work because their kid has diarrhea now when they don't need the antibiotic. So a lot of it is about giving them the backup plan and why you're not doing something. I don't think we explain enough in our fields. All right. So lots of language barriers. I will tell you one of my stories. I was like running, running around really busy. I went in very confidently to a the Hispanic family. They came in because um, they had a, a pain in the leg. And I told them very confidently that they had fractured their huevos. 
They looked at me in sheer horror, like, oh my God, it came in my leg pain, and you're telling me something else is fractured. I said, I'll, I think I said something really bad, I'll be right back. I went out to the nursing desk, and I said, I think I said something back, and they started cracking up. But what I didn't realize is that Wavos is also part of the male anatomy, so I had to kind of uh, shock them into thinking they had done something bad. So, Wavos is what I, the word I was looking for. So, don't do what I do, do what I say, and get a translator. Okay, because you don't want to be telling people that they've done things that they haven't uh, done. I love the idea that Diane just mentioned about the, the earphones. God, think about how many times you're interrupted when you're doing an EKG. You, you know, we've had actually misses where the doc is looking at EKG and somebody comes in with, with some question and they, they say it's fine and then we have missed MI. So I love that idea of like the visual that don't talk to me right now. So I might have to think about that. All right, communication, right? Nonverbal. We do a lot of nonverbal communication. I learned a new phrase the other day, actually a couple of weeks ago, I was giving a talk to about 150 people, and there was somebody sitting right in the middle, actually right where you are. Can you raise your hand? You right there. Raise your hand. Everybody see my friend here? Right? So he's sitting kind of right in the middle, and every time I look at him, he's doing like this. Not that you're doing that right now, but he was frowning at me, right? And I come over here, and he's frowning at me. And after a while, I just, I'm an ER doc, right? I can only do so many things. I finally stopped the talk, and I said, I don't think we're resonating because you're frowning at me the whole time. And he goes, no, 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 I'm concentrating. At the end of the talk, I ask people if they have one thing that they want to add to the discussion. He raises his hand, and you're right in the middle, so I can't even ignore you, right? Because if you're over here, I could not pick on you, but he's right there in the middle. And he goes, I want to tell you something. My name is Happy Jack. I'm like, well, you could have fooled me because you're frowning at me the whole time, right? Um, but he says, I'm going to fix my RBF. Who knows what an RBF is? So I can't really say because I'm going to get in trouble, but what is an RBF? You hear what she said? Resting bitch face. Do you guys, okay, let that resonate for a minute. I had no idea what that meant. Just because I'm an ER doc doesn't mean that I know what everything means. So I went blank, right, facial expression blank. About 100 people yell out, resting bitch face. And I go, you know, that's actually really interesting because I think all of us have one of those at some point. I don't see any right this minute, but. Uh, <laughs> um, and I thought about that, and I go, you know, when I'm intubating somebody, I get really quiet, and I don't tell the patient what I'm doing. I start checking the tube and the lingoscope, making sure everything's safe. The nurse is drawing up the meds, and there's a silence that I really hadn't noticed before. So that comment made me think, and so now what I do, I call it caring out loud. I tell the patient what I'm doing. I'm going to be checking the equipment. I need to make sure everything's you know, safe for you. I'm going to be quiet because I need to focus for a couple minutes, but I'm right here. If you need anything, just call my name. Change the atmosphere in that entire room. Right? So think about how you come across. And a lot of times it's because we're concentrating, but that visual, visual cue does come across, just like the arms crossed. And I, I notice I tend to do this when I'm, when I'm focusing, and I've got to purposely kind of open up my stance so that I'm not frowning at people and, and, and listening like this. So keep that in mind as well. All right, posture. You know, the nurses and staff do this all the time as well. I'm surprised how many of us are walking around with our devices and things like that, and people do pay attention to how you look versus a professional stance. So we talked about facial expressions. I think that's actually really important in the, the new term that I, that I just learned. And think about which doctor would you prefer. And I actually think that it depends, right? If I'm really sick, I probably want the serious guy, right? Because I want him to think about what's going on. I'd rather him have the RBF than be all happy and friendly, be a tigger and not know what the heck he's doing, right? And so I think it depends. When you have to be serious, be serious, right? But in general, yes, you'd like the, the happy, smiley face. All right. We talked a lot about this. That If you sit, or we will talk about it, sitting at the bedside is huge. And I'm finding more and more, as I coach a lot of the physicians and our ancillary staff as well, that there's so much time spent on the computer that that art is gone. You know, those of you that practiced before EMR, remember sitting at the bedside and writing notes and actually making eye contact. And so many people now are just typing on the computer. And you've got to figure out a way to sit with your patients. The studies actually show if you sit with your patients, they give you 15% extra credit. That's a lot of time considering how busy most of you are, right? So wouldn't you want 15% extra credit for more time spent? If you hover over them and give them that same information, they underestimate the time that you spend by about 7% at minimum, right? Plus, they think you're rushed. Right? And so half of what you say is going in one ear, out the other ear. I was coaching a doc recently, and he knew I was watching him. The only thing that was available was a bedside commode. Guess where he sat? <laughs> right? I was horrified, so was the patient. All we wanted him to do was get up off the toilet. You know, that really wasn't, that's not the intention. You know, so 
I, I don't want you sitting on the bed, you're right, that's really difficult to do. Uh, we have patients with MRSA, with scabies, the alarm will go off, and so we're, we're doing this whole thing where we're getting chairs and walking cane chairs and things like that so we can have you sit at the bedside. It really does make a difference, and it's really important to get at eye level. And I think about the news that we deliver. Just recently, we have uh, a, a very sick patient, actually. He was uh, doing a marine exercise with some of those sticks that they fight with, and the, the stick actually protruded through the, through the padding, and it poked him in the eye, and it went deep, and he actually fractured his orbit, one of the orbital bones, and then actually got a, had a stroke afterwards. Okay? The neurosurgeon came out. To, we were just happened to be visiting the family as part of my new role. And he came out, and it was a couple of the, the, the wrestling team folks were there as well. But um, the doctor initially just stood, trying to give him some, some news here. And it, it, that was not, you know, we wanted him to sit and deliver whatever news you have to give, it really is important to sit at the bedside, when you, especially when you're delivering news like that, all right? So keep that in mind as well. All right, if you want a study, some people actually want the study, there is a study looking specifically at this. You can see those little walking cane chairs, we were trialing those, they hold like 200 pounds. Some of our docs have back aches, so they actually liked having the chair that they could walk around with, but it's just a way to engage and sit down. This patient on the left is actually a 35-year-old who has end-stage stomach cancer. He wanted to know what the last days of his life are going to look like, and the only chair in the room was actually occupied by the sister. So imagine having that conversation just standing over the bed, and we do that all the time, right? And so my role at Scripps now is actually changing culture and thinking about putting the patient in the middle, right, and changing that culture. We're doing patients a favor. And ask yourself this question, would you like you taking care of you? If the answer to that is yes, then hats off to you. But I will tell you that there are days when I probably would not have wanted myself taking care of myself, right, because there's just patients that drive you absolutely nutty. So what I do now is actually I pretend that I'm on video every single patient every single time, right, because they're going to they're gonna push your buttons, and, but how would you like how you react to them on YouTube? Right? And actually, I'm not so far from, from being you know, on top of things now. The police department had that body cam. Right? You guys have seen them as well. There's been reports just recently with people who have left their iPhones on. There was one just, I think, last year in the operating room where the surgeon and the anesthesiologist were talking smack about the patient. She had her iPhone on recording the entire conversation. Right? So you actually don't know who's recording you. Right? And I actually gave this scenario to uh, one of our nursing staff members, and she raised her hand, and she goes, you know, I really like that idea of being on video. Can I share a story with you, one that I would not have wanted on video? I said, absolutely. She said one of her patients was just really, just really agitated, really angry, and just not a nice person. And, and she tried her best to make him feel better. What can I do to make things better for you? And there was nothing she could do to make him happy. And finally, he just he looked her in the eye, and he goes, go to hell. So, what would you say when you're trying to help somebody and they tell you to go to hell? I'll be right back. Who <laughs> said that? <laughs> I, I love that. You know why? Because you get yourself out of that environment, right? Because that's not nice. And so she said what she said. He said, go to hell. And she looked at him. He goes, I'll meet you there. <laughs> Which I, she started laughing at. I'm supposed to be the chief experience officer. I just thought it was hysterical. But then I'm supposed to discipline him. I'm like, that's really not the right answer, right? Um, here's one for, this is one I knew. And that's when I kind of got the idea of pretending to be videotaped. I'm, I'm walking in, we talked about burnout earlier. I was already feeling like I didn't want, I was running the ER at Rady Children's, and I was also working general emergency shifts. And I was already feeling the difference in myself. I was feeling a little stressed because I'm setting up this new program, which we'll talk about a little bit tomorrow, about you know, rapid medical exams and things like that. And so I noticed a difference in myself. I'd pull up to my other job, and oh, I'm at work, and versus, oh, I'm going to work today. So I already was noticing that change in myself. And you've got to notice that in yourself. No one else will, you know, don't rely on somebody else to pick it up for you. Yes, we should be looking out for each other, but notice those cues. I literally had just walked in and I hear this lady yelling, you know, out of a patient room, just yelling. And your normal reaction when somebody's yelling is to do what? Security. Security. <laughs> you guys are definitely ER folks. So I'm walking, minding my own bit, all this yelling. All I did was look over, literally just to see what the commotion was about, right? Look over, and she catches my eye and she goes, What are you looking at, bitch? You guys are laughing, really? This is not this is, this is insulting. I'm actually very I'm actually a very nice person, and I know people don't call me names like that. Um, so I look at her, and that hair on the back of your neck, you know, when you're just like annoyed. And this is this is you guys have known me for like a few minutes now. I'm actually a really nice person. What should have been my response when she's calling me a name? I don't even know her, by the way, so I haven't done anything to her yet. So what should have been my response? Do you need help would have been a very nice thing to say. Sorry you're having a bad day. You know, how can I help you? Would have been a better answer. I look at her. She goes, what are you looking at, bitch? And I said, not much. And I kept walking. 
I know, it's horrible, didn't it? <laughs> I told you, do what I say, not what I did, right? So I'm like, oh my God, I just insulted a patient. I, the doctor's room is like right there, right? And I go, I'm just gonna get in big trouble now. Instead, I get a high five from the doc and the social worker because she's been a pain in the ass all day, right? <laughs> Finally, somebody said something to her. What was my punishment? <laughs> Guess who gets sign over? Me, I get to go in now and take over her care. I'm like, oh my God, I'm getting ready to apologize, right? I, said, I know I, I messed up. I'll go in, I'll say, hi, I'm Dr. Sharif. I'm sorry I insulted you. Let's start over. I didn't even barely get in the room. And she goes, you're the bitch that told me I was nothing to look at. I'm like, really? That's the second time in 10 minutes, right? The right answer now is, I'm sorry that we started off that way. And I actually didn't say that. My reaction was, yeah, and I'm the bitch who's here to take care of you. So how are we going to go? You know? <laughs> So uh, that was my clue that perhaps I wasn't happy <laughs> taking care of these patients anymore, and I got, eventually got myself off the schedule. Um, people have asked me, well, how did that turn out for you? And I, I hate to tell you this, but it actually worked, because it actually settled her down. She actually needed somebody to, be, to take a firm hand with her, but that's not the answer. The answer is not to call your, not, not to tell, you know, I just owned it. I was being bitchy, so I did, but let's not do that, right? The answer is, is to be nicer to your patients. All right, crossed arms we talked about. Eye contact is huge, and that's why I'm very concerned about all of us typing on the computer, right? Because we really are getting away from being at the bedside. The shorter your interaction is, the more important that you make eye contact and a, little, a hand, you know, hand gesture. I was uh, coaching an urgent care doc, and I went in and he, he with him, because I, I do it in real time, and he started right in. Hi, I'm Dr. So-and-so, here's what we're here to do. And I said, you don't, you don't even shake his hand or anything, right? He goes, I don't like touching people. I'm like, you're an ER doc, for goodness sakes, right? Can you at least put your hand on the patient's shoulder and say, hi, I'm Dr. Sharif, I'm going to take good care of you, right? He started doing that one thing different, and his scores have gone up dramatically because it's that personal touch that they want, right? I had uh, realized, you know, the importance of touch, and I get that, but be careful of the chief complaint before we start shaking people's hands, right? So, Farscadia just came out. One of my residents came to get me, and she said, I don't know what this rash is. Can you come look at it, right? So, I said, I'll, I'll go look at the rash. I go in. The dad's wearing a, you know, tie and looking pretty fancy, and I said, I'm here to look at your son's rash. Is there anybody, you know, I shake his hand. I'm Dr. Sharif, and I said, does anybody in the family have a similar rash? He goes, while well, you mention it, you know, I've got one right here. What did he have? Scabies. I know, right, scabies. So as soon as I shake, as soon as he tells me that, I feel itchy, right? The this, this psychosomatic reaction we all have, and I wanted to wash my hands so badly, you know? But, and, I, and so I finally got out of the room and washed my hands. I went home, put rid all over myself and all over my kids, even though they weren't in there. That, but, but, so make sure you know the, uh, the you know, chief complaint before you go in, but you can at least put your hand on the patient's shoulder, right? So that's actually really important. All right, we talked about this as well. Okay, staying calm under pressure. You had mentioned that you were going to leave the room when somebody, you know, when, when that person's yelling. And I think actually that's the right answer. A lot of times, if somebody's really agitated, take a moment. And what I have started telling people when they're getting agitated with me is like, you know what, I think we're starting off on the wrong foot. I'm going to leave, and I'm going to come back in five minutes, and we're going to start over, and let's see how this goes, right? Go back in five minutes. If they're still agitated, you know, I'm going to give you one more try here. I'm really trying to help you, but I, I, can't, I can't do this if you're yelling at me. And I'm going to go out one more time to give you one more chance. Usually the second time they're fine, right? And so calming yourself down is actually easier said than done, but it really is important because you go in the defensive, and again, would you want, that, want your reaction on videotape? And I can promise you the answer is probably no to that as well. Okay. So um, tension, right? I, in myself, I notice that hair on the back of my neck going up, and I think you need to recognize that in yourself and definitely take time out. We had one of our docs actually had a, a father who wanted him to do surgery on his child, and the surgery wasn't warranted. He just wanted him to have it, and the father got very agitated and actually called the doctor an idiot. He said, you're an idiot. And this is a very well-known surgeon who's exceptional in his field, and he got defensive. He started telling him how many surgeries he'd done. I've done a thousand of these before, and blah, blah, blah. When somebody's upset with you, it doesn't matter how many surgeries you have, right? Don't go into defense mode. The guy stormed out of the office, went on Yelp, Health Grades, and one other website, and really blasted this doc. And the doc was really upset about it. He could not sleep literally for a week. He goes, I've never had an interaction like that. And so he finally emailed me and said, can you come and talk to me, and what should I have done? And he said, well, all you had to do was get yourself out of that situation. Just say, you know what, you're really upset. I'm going to come back out and we're going to talk about this. Or just say, I'm really sorry that you feel that way. I can't meet your expectations on this one, right? So I think we're going to have to stop our visit. 
I will see if there's another surgeon I can refer you to, but I can't be the one to have that, do that surgery for you because I, I can't do something I don't believe in. End of story. See the, the calmness, but it's very easy when somebody's personally attacking you to fall into that trap, especially when he's got Yelp reviews that are just horrible about him, right? So keep that in mind as well. All right, here's my case. I actually was doing somebody a favor. One of my friends wanted to go on a date, right? And she said, can you cover my shift? No good deed goes unpunished, right? So I'm, I'm happy. I'm a tigger when I come to work. I actually like going to work. Here's the, the parent, actually the dad. Um, it wasn't so much the, the mom was fine. It was, it was the dad. 15-year-old male presents to the ED requesting a drug screen. So the dad wants a drug screen for his kid. And he's got normal vital signs. The kid is refusing to give you a urine sample. And then the dad says he's a lawyer and he threatens to sue you if you don't get the, the urine test that he's asking for you. And then he says, by the way, my, my daughter is here and I want you to do a, you know, a, a pelvic exam to see if she's sexually active. And he didn't just say he was going to sue me. He said he's going to sue my ass if I didn't uh, do these tests on him. Okay, so what would you do? First of all, these kids... You can't force them to have the test in the first place, and the AAP is very strong about that. If it's not warranted, you don't have to do it, right? So do I tell them that, that I don't have to do what you asked me to do? What do you do? Yeah, you Say it, say it. What are you going to do? <laughs> call security. They want to call security. Because <laughs> he's upsetting you, right? He's threatening you and all this stuff. Uh, take a moment, right? He's upset about something. Right? You just barely walked in the room, so there's, there's something more going on, and you've got, you've got time, right? Take a deep breath. So I went out of the room, I said, excuse me for a minute, and this is how it felt. When someone, I get out of this, somebody's going to die, because I had just done myself, my friend a favor, and I'm really upset with her, actually. <laughs> like, really, if I hadn't done this nice thing, I wouldn't be being yelled at right this minute. I actually excused myself from the room. I said, you know what? I'm going to come back in, in just a minute. I need to take care of something. Clearly, you need a little more time. I was actually very proud of myself, considering what I told you, I told the other patient. So I was actually, I was actually very proud of myself for, for taking that moment for myself. I go out, and I thought, you know what? This guy's already, he's already pushing my buttons. Right? And so I got to do something else. And I remember this quote from Warren Beatty You've achieved success in your field when you don't know whether you're doing is work, what you're doing is work or play. And we all love what we do, right? There are, I get it, there are patients and days when we're not happy, but overall we, like, we actually like what we're doing, right? And so I wasn't going to let this guy get the better of me, especially because I was just coming on shift. And so I, I decided instead of calling security and yelling back at him and telling him I don't have to do what you don't want to do, I said, I, t I pulled the dad out. I said, I really need to talk to you privately for a minute. And I took him into our conference room and I said, something more is going on here, right? I'd like to understand where you're coming from. And he literally just broke down. He goes, you know what? We're going through a divorce right now. I feel like I have absolutely no control of my family. And this was my way of trying to exert my control back because I thought I could get him to you know, do this and they would know that I'm, I'm pretty much the boss. And I said, you know, that's gonna, not, not going to work, right? You're going to lose complete trust if you have any left at all with your kids anyway. How about if we have a social worker come and talk to you guys, right, and help you work through some of this stuff right now, right? But what I will do is we're going to go back in together. I'm going to say your dad and I talked, and your dad has decided that we're not going to do these tests, right? Put the power back in his hands. Completely different experience, because when I've had some of my colleagues have similar things like this, and they go right into defense mode. I don't have to do that test. You know, I've got these guidelines that say I don't have to do it, and they get in a war, and that's never going to help you. Right? There are some times when people just are not going to like you. Believe it or not, it's just the way it is. I remember distinctly having a young mom come in with her, her, her child had abdominal pain, and she had read somewhere that ultrasound was the best way to diagnose belly pain. Well, it's true for appendicitis and things like that, but this kid was constipated, right? for sure. I even got an x-ray and there's balls of stool everywhere. Right? And I even showed her the x-ray, but she was demanding an ultrasound. It was after hours. We didn't, at that point, have 24-hour ultrasound coverage, right? And so I wasn't going to call in my tech from home for an ultrasound that wasn't warranted, right? Patient experience doesn't mean you give patients what they want, necessarily. It means explaining, and I tried my best. She just wasn't buying any of it, and she wanted to talk to my supervisor. Well, I was running the ER. There was no supervisor for her to have at that moment, and I said, you know, I am the supervisor. Okay, what can we do at this point? Because I'm not going to order the ultrasound. I, here's what your child has, and, and that's what we, we can give an enema. We can do some other things, and so what can we do to make this better? And she looked at me, and she goes, I want a male doctor. Well, I couldn't do a whole lot at that moment about that. All we had was a male med student. So what did I do? <laughs> I didn't fake it. I said, I have a male med student. Would you like to speak with him? And she did. I coached him on what to say. Here's what you say. He goes and says the exact same thing 
that I just told her, and she goes, oh, okay, I'm like, really? So, boy, she didn't want to hear from me. She wanted the male doctor to tell her. He was like third-year med student, for goodness sakes, but hey, whatever worked for her, right? He just wasn't, I get it, and sometimes you got to get somebody else, right? And that's okay. I've been that person for other people. You talk about spinal taps. I don't want to have a spinal tap or whatever. I go in, and I say, you know, here's why we need it, and they say, okay, that makes sense. So sometimes it just takes another person. That's okay. Don't take it personally, right? All right. Angry patients. We get a lot of these, right? And so I, I've told you kind of, kind of my tricks. I've had angry surgeons be really obnoxious. Have any of you have any angry surgeons at you? Come on, you have two. All right. Um, so I had one that was kind of irate. He actually was really mean to my PA. I was talking to Martha about it earlier. He actually made her cry. Uh, you know, it was, it was so rude to her. Didn't want to talk to her. Didn't want any part of it. You know, I want to talk to your attending, you know, attending physician, that kind of thing. And, and so, you know, got on the phone well, with that surgeon and said, you know, I, it's not acceptable for you to treat my staff that way, right? But time and time again when that has happened, uh, I've had a response now. And I said, you know what? I'm trying to treat you with respect. I just really appreciate the same respect back. And that works with surgeons just as well as it does with the, these angry patients, right? And so a lot of times they're angry for something that you might be able to control. Many times it's because they've been in you know, three different emergency departments and not getting the answer that they want or their doctor's not answering. It may be something that, that you might be able to fix later. And I'll say, you know, your point is well taken right now, but right now I want to try and take care of you. So I promise to deal with that issue, and I'll follow up with whatever that is, but right now I want to take care of you, right? And that usually de-escalates them. And thank you for, and thank them for giving you a chance to fix it. All right. If you can't fix it, then try and escalate it to somebody else who can, because you don't want them leaving your department feeling upset. Right? There's always somebody above you, usually, that can, they can make it better. Right? The people that don't like us, and I've looked at the survey after survey after survey, are usually about 5% of the population. And those are the ones that are never going to be happy. It doesn't matter what you do. Right? The other people, and we'll talk more about this tomorrow in the surveys, but they actually think you're doing a pretty good job. And we just have to move some of those people. It can be as simple as giving them a blanket yourself. I don't know how many times patients are touched by the fact that I personally will go and get them a blanket and bring it to them. Like, wow, the doctor did that for me. Right? And so it's little things. And so doing something a little bit different from people that already think you're doing a good job is really where you can make the most impact. The angry ones, you just got to have to do your, you know, do your best. I will usually say, you know, you're really, because I did a lot of complaint management, so you're really upset right now. What can I do to make this better? And a lot of times I actually thought it was a, it got a bill that they wanted their money back. It turns out a lot of times they just wanted an apology, either from the nurse or the doctor. You know, they were kind of rude and abrupt. I just really want them to apologize. And imagine telling some of your docs that they have to apologize to a patient, right? That doesn't always go over very well. Uh, we just had this happen recently with one of our patient services reps. So I'm, my friend of mine has breast cancer, and she was trying to get her breast surgery scheduled between two, two surgeons, and they're going back and forth, back and forth. And the one scheduler was actually a little bit rude on the phone to my friend, who is not a whiner. She actually just wanted both breasts off. She goes, you know what, I want them both off. They accidentally scheduled for unilateral instead of bilateral, so there was some confusion on the schedule. But the first scheduler was actually a little bit rude. I called the other one, because my friend called me and said, can you help me? I called the other scheduler, and I let her know. I said, you know, uh, Cynthia was a little bit rude on the phone to my friend. And what's the answer when somebody complains to you about one of your staff members or one of your colleagues? What's that? I'll address it, right? Or I'm really the apologize, apology first. I'm really sorry that that happened. I'll be sure to to give that feedback, which is fabulous that you said that because most people don't want to do that, right? And how can I help you at this moment? I got none of that. The answer was, well, she's never done that to anybody else before. Okay, then you pick on my friend to do that too, right? That patient decided, my friend decided not to use that surgeon because of the scheduler. The surgeon's phenomenal. She's a really good reconstructive surgeon, but she didn't want to go because of that frontline staff. So it's really important that we all kind of line things up really well together because it doesn't matter how good the physicians and clinicians are if you have a, a grumpy nurse or somebody on the front end of things. So they just, that is just true to date. I had my first child 18 years ago at the Navy Hospital. My husband was a VIP. He was chief resident. I was an attending physician at Rady's already. So we're supposed to get VIP care, right? The fact that I'm telling this story 18 years later shows you how sad I still am, right? And so VIP care, the nurse, I could not figure out. One minute she was happy, next minute mean, happy, mean, happy. Every time I thought I was going to get it, ask for a new nurse, she decided to do something nice. So I think we were being overly nice doctor patients because we didn't want to be those types. 
18 hours later, I delivered, had a pretty big postpartum bleed, and I had blood on my gown, right? And I, we had to go down the hallway to get transferred to the uh, postpartum area. And I really wanted to change my gown, right? I didn't want blood on it. We actually knew some of the residents and staff, and I had a little bit of dignity left, right? I just, yes, my legs were just up in the air, but still, I didn't want to go traipsing down the hallway with blood on my gown. And she said, no, we'll do it there. And I said, I'm changing my gown. How long does it take to change a gown? Like, I'm an ER doc, so like five seconds maybe, right? But the fact that she put such a fuss about it was really annoying. Because we were VIPs, when the uh, patient services representative came to speak with us the next day, I told her about my experience, and she said, okay, we'll address it. And then I got nothing back. As a patient, I would like to have known that somebody had spoken with that nurse, right, and had given some feedback. Better yet, the nurse could come, but I get it. We do shift work. So just as if you've been grumpy with somebody, you can't come back, but you can certainly let the patient know that we've addressed that issue, and thank you for letting us know. And that, that, I'm left 18 years later wondering if anybody's ever talked to that nurse at all, and if I was a VIP, what was she doing to everybody else? Right? Does that make sense? So don't be defensive, apologize, and give the feedback to the other person. I think that's really important. People are really anxious when they come see us, and so I usually will say, I, I can see, see that this is really worrying you. I might not be able to find the final diagnosis. A lot of people, they've had pain for years and they want us to fix it in one ER visit. I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to do that, but I can rule out some of the bad things that I'm really worried about, and then we'll get you on to the specialist who can do a deep dive. My job is to, to make sure there's nothing life-threatening. That usually calms them down a little bit as well. So it's really important that you manage your team up. Uh, I was at P.F. Chang's one day, and I realized that we had to do a very bad job in emergency medicine of managing each other up and signing out. So the, the server came to me um, with somebody with him. He goes, I'm going off duty, but Matt's going to be taking care of you, and he's going to bring you lunch. And I thought, wow, that's really cool. And what do we do in medicine? We sign over to each other, and we don't go in the room together. So I'm giving bad news to people I've never met before. And so we made a rule where we all go in together at change of shift, and I would say, hi, this is Dr. Lucio, he's coming on shift, and he goes, oh yeah, Dr. Sharif told me all about you, and I'm going to take really good care of you. It takes 30 seconds to do that kind of introduction, but we don't do that enough, right? Please don't disparage anybody else. I hear that time and time again, oh, I can't believe that doctor did that for you, right? And we do that all the time, and they do it to us more in the ER. Wow, the ER did that, so I'm working with the outside folks as well, telling them not to do that. Don't bash us either. All right, just a quick thing on EHR. I always tell patients, you know, I'm, I'm logging in the computer. I share the screen with them so they know what I'm doing. And I actually look at the labs with them as well. And so they actually don't feel like I'm just a doctor typing. I explain what I'm doing to them, call it carrying out loud as well. And so I log in and log out in front of them. So I think that's actually really important. Sometimes you just, all you can do is pray that those patients are going to leave you alone and uh, get, get out of there for you. But I think it's really important that you, you kind of think about some of these phrases that we talked about.